My name is Basir M. Chawi. I'm the host of Like It Should Be, and we're talking with Brother Abdullah Abdur Razak about the Nation of Islam and his relationship to Brother Malcolm X. We're going to be doing two 30-minute segments, okay, and um, I'm going to make some introductory remarks first, but I think that's the way we actually need to really proceed. First, I'd like to... Uh, Thank CMOTAP for doing this program. I think it's critically important. Um, I had a conversation with uh, Sister Betty Dobson, and uh, right after Peter Bailey was scheduled to be here during February. And I said, well, if you want to have Peter Bailey at CMOTAP, then you need to be introduced to a brother, the brother sitting right next to me, Brother Abdullah, Abdullah Abdul Razak. Now, I'm just going to say a few things about Brother Abdullah first, and that is uh, I've known Brother Abdullah for almost 40 years. When I first met him, I had absolutely no idea that he had any relationship with Brother Malcolm X at all. Uh, we, uh, he was involved at the time in an independent black school, a school called the al Karim School, and it was for that reason that we actually uh, started to communicate. Uh, I was at that particular point at the East organization, and we had at that time the largest independent black school in the country, a school called Uhura Sasa. As a matter of fact, we have at least one Uhura Sasa uh, Shule student in the audience here, a graduate of Uhura Sasa. Anyway, uh, in the early 1970s, I had an opportunity to lead a trip to Guyana, South America. And Brother Abdullah and his wife came on that particular trip. Now, an interesting thing about Brother Abdullah is, you know, I was doing, aside from the work of doing this trip, a lot of diplomatic work. And in doing that diplomatic work, I would have to go to various government offices and meet with various officials in Guyana. And I would be leaving the offices, and then all of a sudden, who would I see? I'd see Brother Abdullah. And I'd say, Brother Abdullah, what are you doing? And he'd say, well, I'm doing research. I said, you're doing research? And he said, yeah. And... Uh, what he was doing at that particular time is he was doing the groundwork for beginning a project of cooperative farming in Guyana, which he did for a period of 12 years, from 1976 until 1988. Okay? Uh, Brother Abdullah is fascinating in and of himself. As a matter of fact, I found out that Brother Abdullah was involved with Brother Malcolm when this book came out in 1989, because this particular book by Bruce Perry, edited by Bruce Perry, uh, Malcolm X, The Last Speeches, has uh, an introduction in which he talks about how he got the tapes for these particular speeches, which he did from Brother Abdullah here. Now, this was in the uh, 1980s at that particular point, and this book came out in 1989. So it was only in 1989 that I began to have any understanding that Brother Abdullah was involved with Brother Malcolm at all. It's only been now, in the last about five years, that Brother Abdullah and myself have been communicating about his experiences in the Nation of Islam and his relationship to Brother Malcolm X. And, well, we're going to share some of that information with you today. Uh, we're going to do, as we said, two segments. And, hey, we're going to have a good time. Uh, well, I'm going to be interviewing Brother Abdullah Abdur Razak. Brother Abdullah is a fascinating person on so many different levels, but we're going to concentrate today on his experiences in the Nation of Islam and his relationship with Brother Malcolm X. Brother Abdullah, how are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm alive, vertical, in motion, no complaints. How did you get involved in the Nation of Islam? <laughs> I had heard a lot about these people who were calling white people devils. And I thought they were crazy. But I had a friend who knew I was interested in languages. And he asked me to come to a mosque on State Street run by a man named Sheikh Dawood. 
And I went, and, uh, but I didn't go in because they were praying. And at that time, I was an atheist. Uh, so he asked me, had I ever heard Malcolm X speak? And I said, no. And he said, you should go and hear him. I said, I don't want to go down. People, <laughs> people are crazy down there. So he convinced me once, and I promised. I said, okay, one day when I'm not doing anything, I'll go. I'll go. So one Sunday, I saw him, and he said, what you doing today? I said, nothing. I forgot I had promised to go hear this Malcolm X. So I went down 116th Street and got highly offended because they searched you before you went in. And uh, Malcolm was not there that day. Lewis spoke, and he scared the bejesus out of me. He's running back and forth on the stage, calling people all kind of names. And I said, this man must have lost his mind up here today. I said, I'm going to be sitting in here, and the police or the FBI are going to come breaking in here, and I'm going to get locked up. But that didn't happen. So I left thoroughly disagreeing with most of the things that he said. But as I got on the subway to go home, some of the things started sinking in. So I said, well, let me go back Wednesday, and maybe Malcolm will be speaking. I went back Wednesday, Malcolm wasn't speaking. I had to go there about five times before I caught Brother Malcolm. And I argued with him. I said, you know, we all know that the white man ain't no good. I mean, he enslaved us. He used our women, sold our children like they was calves or kittens, worked us to death. We still the first fired and the last hired. We lived. I, I, I got all the complaints, and my family's from the South, so I know what I'm talking about. I know they ain't no good. In Richmond, Virginia, there was a, a park. What, black people couldn't go in that park. People descended from slaves couldn't go in that park unless you were pushing a, a little white baby. I think it was called Dickie Bird Park or something. Anyway, I went to Virginia every summer, so I knew. I mean, you couldn't urinate where you wanted to urinate. You couldn't, get a, you couldn't drink water out of a white fountain. It was, a, it was really a mess, so I, I felt that. So, but I still could not conceive of them as devils. <laughs> and one day Malcolm said, I would, they always had a question, and answer, a question and answer period, and I'd raise my hand. How you going to call a white man a devil? So he got me one day by saying, he said, look, if you were the devil, would you take pictures of yourself and put them all around and say, I'm the devil? No, because then you could never catch nobody. So you disguise yourself, right? I said, yeah, because I had pictures of the Native American when he wanted to go buffalo hunting. He would take a buffalo skin and put it over and go riding on his horse so the buffaloes thought he was a buffalo. See, then he'd kill him. So I said, yeah, that, that makes sense. He said, he has you thinking that a devil is a little red man with horns and cloven hoofs and a tail sticking out with three, three tines to it, right? And I said, yeah, because there was a paint thinner called Red Devil Paint Thinner. <laughs> and whenever you said devil, that's what I thought of. That's the devil. He said, that's why you don't see him when he be tricking you. I thought about that. I said, that makes sense. And to make a long story short, I went every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday for nine months. And I said, well, this thing makes sense. The men are clean. The women are nicely dressed, covered up. They ain't walking around using all kind of foul language. They had a restaurant that was clean. And I said, well, you know, I was in the Army. The Japanese didn't do nothing to me. The Koreans didn't do nothing to me. And I'm going over there being against them. Now I see some people descended from slaves like myself that are clean, that are neat, that got manners, that cook good food. I say, I'll join. And I, that's how I became a member of the nation. Mm -hmm. About what year did you join that the nation That was 1959 when I got in. But I had been going there about almost a year before I, before I went in. But I got my ex. Ex meant... At that time, Mr. Muhammad taught. He said, look, you walking around here thinking your name is Humperdinck. He said, Humperdinck is not a black man's name. Uh, or you, your name is uh, Foxwood. 
or you got some English name, and most of you have never been to England. He said, the thing that you call a name is not your name. That's someone else's name. That's the name of the last people that owned you during chattel slavery. And just the same way, if you have a car, and that car is registered in your name, you can sell the car to anybody you want. But if you don't change the registration, that car still belongs to the person that it was registered to. So Mr. Muhammad said the so-called Negro was walking around here with names that belong to the people that own them. So they are still the property of the European whose name he thinks he has. So I said, wow, that's heavy. So what Mr. Muhammad said, your mother gave you a name. Your mother called you James. But that other name, that warden, that was not your name. That was the name of the people who owned your family. So he said, what we'll do is you will now become James X warden. Just like if any of you were married and you're not married anymore, you will say, well, that was my ex-husband or that was my ex-wife. So I said, yeah, I'm an ex-warden. I ain't no warden no more. I'm James. I don't know what my uh, real name is. Uh, so I started doing genealogical research. Uh, and I had a passport in my name. When we went on the trip, I think I was the only one that had an original name because I sent my passport of James Warden back to the State Department. And I said, I am now Abdullah H. Abdul Razak. So they sent me back the passport saying, also known as Abdullah H. Abdul Razak. So I sent them back the passport. I said, I'm not also known as anyone. I am who I say I am. And if you have a problem with that, write me a letter telling me that it is the official policy of the United States government that I am to remain a slave in perpetuity and always be known by the name of the last persons who owned me under chattel slavery, or find out the first African ancestor that came to the United States in a slave ship and put his name on my passport. Otherwise, send me back my damn passport in my name. It was four days before the trip. And I sent the passport back. And my wife says, well, suppose, suppose the passport don't come back in time. I said, then we won't make the trip. She said, but you paid for it. I said, that's all right. I'd rather lose the money than to be going, leaving this country in a slave name. Within four days, I had my passport back. And I have the letter, if anyone doubts that, that I wrote to them. Because when I worked for the Schoenberg, they said, well, can we get your freedom of information files? I said, sure, but write the State Department too because I sent them a letter about my passport and they had a copy of that letter. 30 some years later, they still had a copy of the letter that I, that I sent to them. I've never had any problem with my passport or my children's passport since then. Mm -hmm. What was your position in the Nation of Islam in 1962? Let's move forward just a little bit. Okay, I was a brother. That's the most important position I had. I was a brother. But in, in the Nation of Islam, we had a saying, there'll be men in the ranks who'll stay in the ranks. Why? I'll tell you why. Simply because they do not have the ability to get things done. So when you went in the nation, they didn't care whether you were short or tall, thin or fat, dark or light, bright or dumb. Could you get something done? If someone said, I want this drum moved over to the door, could you get it moved over to the door? If you could do that, you'd move up through the ranks. So it was discovered that I could get things done. If I was told to do something, I figured I was in the army where I had these crackers telling me what to do and I had to do it, otherwise end up in the stockade. So when I had people descended from slaves like myself, southern boys, homies, and they told me to do something, I did it. So they noticed this in me and so they told me they want to put me in lieutenant's training. So I became a lieutenant in the Freedom Fruit of Islam, the FOI. All men in the Nation of Islam were the FOI. There were no pipe gangs and stuff, as your friend Manning Marable says. Every male in the Nation of Islam was called a fruit because the fruit carried the seed of the new nation. So the fruit of Islam were the men. The MGT 
and GCC or Muslim Girls Training and General Civilization class were the women. So all men were called FOI. All women were called MGT. You got people saying that the, the, the FOI was a thug gang, and that's not true. We learned how to take care of our children, how to take care of our wives, how to pay our bills, and a lot of things that uh, the slave process had erased from our consciousness. So we were learning how to be, uh, be men, and the women were learning how to be women, how to take care of their children, how to take care of their husbands, how to cook, so, and they say general civilization class because they say, and in general, how to act at home and abroad. Because a lot of our young women at that time and a lot of our young women at this time don't know how to act at home and don't know how to act abroad. They don't know how to cook. They don't know how to sew. They don't know how to take care of their children. They know how to, as, as a woman said, they know how to take care of a man as long as they lay in horizontal. But once they get vertical, they can't keep a man. And that's a problem that we have. So no, no, no. That's what we learned in the Nation of Islam, contrary to what the press uh, and other people wanted to say. Uh, at a particular point within the Nation of Islam, you became the circulation manager for yes. Muhammad Speaks. Yes. How did that happen? That happened because uh, I used to subscribe to specialty salesmen and salesmen's opportunity magazines. And I never saw, my mother used to drove into her son's heads. If she saw us looking in front of a mirror, she said, get the hell away from that mirror. You ain't pretty. You ain't cute. Cute make it with a girl. Cute don't make it with no man. She said, what you are put here for is to make money. Go out and make some money. Wash your sneakers. Your feet stink. Uh, go out and do something positive. Make some money. So I was in the habit of going, picking up bottles, going to the store for people, sweeping the side. Or anything to make a couple to make a couple of dollars, and I'd always give my mother, you know, a dollar here, my hair's a dollar, that kind of thing. So I always sold things from door to door. And I noticed when the Muhammad Speaks newspaper came out, a lot of the brothers did things that was really backwards for a salesman. Like if a man is walking this way, you don't walk this way and try to sell him the paper. You walk with him. This way you can be talking to him while he's walking. He gets annoyed if you stop him. So they noticed that I would do this with the brothers, and, and Brother Malcolm asked me would I take the, a job as a circulation manager of the Muhammad Speaks newspaper for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut because the papers were stacking up. Brothers were paying for the papers, but they weren't selling them. So uh, I said, yeah, so I took the job. That's how I became the circulation manager. Mm -hmm. Brother Malcolm kind of singled you out because you had the capacity to go ahead and complete task. Yes. Talk about some of the tasks you completed and how you really got Brother Malcolm's attention. Okay. First, I have to tell you, I learned in the United States Army, when, when somebody told you to do something, you didn't say, well, I can't do that. You, you, you did it or you died trying. And they told you all kind of crazy things. If somebody throw a hand grenade, you're supposed to take your helmet, throw it over the hand grenade, jump over it and lay on it. If you if, you, if, if there was a barbed wire fence and you wanted to get over the fence, you were supposed to go throw yourself up on the barbed wire and let the other dudes crawl over your back and everything. And nobody argued about that. You, know, you couldn't argue because you had a guy with all of these stripes telling you this stuff, and in your mind you were saying, this dude must be out of his mind. But when push came to shove, you had to do it. A lot of people don't know. Officers in the service wear sidearms. They don't carry rifles. And the reasons they carry that sign on, if he gives you a direct order and you disobey, he can shoot you. And nothing you can do about it. So I found this out. I said, oh, man. Well, when I went into the nation, I said, here are men that look just like me, that talk just like me, that have the same problems that I have. And they told me to do something. I didn't question it. And Malcolm, by this time, I saw this man as such a genius that when he told me to do something, I never doubted that I could do it. I would just go ahead and try to do it, which, left on my own, I might have never done, you know? Uh, one of the things, uh, Governor Rockefeller was coming to the, uh, I think, Americana Hotel. They had a big ballroom set up for, for some kind of big dinner. 
And when I was in the service, I had gone to a place called Yokosuka, Japan, where I had a number of tailor-made suits. So I put on a tailor-made suit, a tailor-made shirt, a tie, a three-piece suit, and the uh, state authorities were not treating Muslims in the prison system right. They tried to force them to eat pork and do all kinds of things, wouldn't give them prayer times and whatnot. So Malcolm was campaigning against that. And so he told me to go down to this dinner for Rockefeller <laughs> and, and put, put these flyers in every seat. And I went up there and put one in every seat. I was on my way out the door before the waiter realized that I wasn't a, you know, a politician or something like that. Uh, so almost anything he told me to do, I did. He told me to go to a particular place and uh, ask a number of questions about how to get things done. And I'd go and do it. And I was always successful. I never had any problems. Because I think I had confidence in his confidence in me. You know, it's just like a child. If you have a child and that child is trying to do something, and you keep telling the child, don't do that, you'll fall. Climb down from there, you'll slip and break your neck. Uh, watch out, you'll slip in the water and drown. Well, you're going to have a, a, fairy, a scaredy child grow up as a result of doing this. And what you're doing is imposing your fears upon the child. Well, Malcolm had a way of getting me to do things by showing, by his telling me what he wanted done, that he had confidence in my ability to do it. So I always was uh, successful. And that in inflated my confidence in myself. I said, you know, you ain't worthless. <laughs> you're all right. You can get things done. And uh, it, it helped me. It helped me to this day. Uh, with the, the passports and things like that. I go down to the place. I said, look, uh, we had, my, my daughters are sitting back there. We had two police, two police women come to my house once and say, uh, my wife said, the police at the door. I said, for what? She said, I don't know. I go to the door. I said, yeah, can I help you? They say, yeah, we, we have to come into your house. I said, you have to come into my house? For what? She said, somebody call 911. I said, ain't nobody call 911 in this house because the phone we had upstairs wasn't even hooked up. It was broke. <laughs> so I said, no. So one of them said, you don't have any say in this. I said, I don't have any say in this in my house? I said, a well uh, uh, no warrant shall issue except upon probable cause, duly described in the articles or persons to be seized. Uh, uh, so I quoted that amendment to them. They stepped back out of my doorway. I said, oh, the first, the, this amendment no longer applies? Oh, well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let you hear the phone call. So they tried to get the phone call on the radio, and they couldn't. So I just stood there. Another cop cop. The point I'm trying to make is I grew up with a fear of police. If I was walking on this side of the street and the cop was walking on the same side, I crossed over because in Harlem, Y'all probably don't remember, but there was a cop named Brisbane. He was black. Woo, he'd whoop your head for nothing. And that's how we, we feared the police. We didn't, like, you know, really respect them. So I was afraid of police. But once I got in the nation, that fear, I, it was a race. So they're nothing but people. If they cut, they bleed just like you. So on, so on, so on, so forth. So in any way, I got a confidence in myself that I had never had before. Plus, I knew... I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I had stopped running and chasing women. And if I got locked up, I knew the nation was going to come and get me. If bail was to be put up, they was going to put the bail up for me. And that happened to me, too. So does that answer your question? I tend to. That's quite okay. I'm an old man. <laughs> In 1962, since we're talking about 1962, what was Brother Malcolm's position within the Nation of Islam? Brother Malcolm's position was Minister of Mosque Number 7. Minister of Mosque number 12, I think, in Philadelphia, 12 or 11, and Minister of Mosque number 4 in Washington, D.C., because Minister Lucius Bayard had got sat down. So he was the minister of three mosques, and he was the national representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was the head of the Nation of Islam. And any time anything went wrong anywhere in the nation, Malcolm was sent to stem it. If it was in Monroe, Louisiana, Newark, New Jersey, Buffalo, New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, 
wherever it was Malcolm who went, not the local minister. He had the right, the capacity to act in the name of Mr. Muhammad. Something happened in 1962, yeah. which was um, critical in the development of the nation and also critical in some decisions that Brother Malcolm would make. I'm talking about the altercation between the police and members of the Nation of Islam in Los Angeles, the situation in which Brother Ronald Stokes was murdered by the police. Can you talk about that situation? Yeah, I can talk about it because prior to that, in Griffith Stadium or uh, Griffith Stadium, or there's another place in Washington, D.C., uh, Uline Arena, I think. In one of those two places, Mr. Muhammad was on the rostrum speaking. And you had the front rostrum post, the men down in front of the rostrum. And I heard this with my ears because I was on post there. He said, you see these men down here? These are Muslims. He says, they are the fruit of Islam. They are the best in North America. And you dare not touch one of them. If you kill one of them, you must die because they are the fruit of Islam. They are the fruit of our new nation. And I exulted at that. I said, finally, this crap about police going around whooping you in the head and doing things, they go pay for it. Well, a couple of months later, the secretary of the Los Angeles mosque, mosque number 27, was shot in the back while his hands were up in the air in surrender, and he was killed dead. Three or four other brothers were shot, one in the back, one in the groin. To make a long story short, one was to be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life, and the Los Angeles police, you couldn't say murder, because the Muhammad Speaks newspaper accused uh, Donald Reese, I believe his name is, of murder, and they had to retract it because the California court found that it was a justifiable murder, though he was shot in the back. And it has to be said to you that are too young to remember, we were never taught to turn the other cheek. We were taught to never be the aggressor. Never start a fight with anyone. But if someone has made up their mind that they're not going to be happy without beating on you, then you fight in the name of God and call on God's name. God will help you because the religion does not teach you to turn the other cheek. It teaches you fight against those who fight against you. But if he inclines toward peace, incline you too toward peace. In other words, if you knock a man down and he says, all right, all right, I give up, I shot, I'm wrong. Don't kick him in the head. No, step back. Let him get up. And if he'll leave in peace, let him go in peace. The point is not to brutally uh, hurt someone, but to defend yourself. So now Brother Malcolm had been all over the United States making fun of people in the nonviolent civil rights movement. And after every lecture that Malcolm gave, he said, those of you who have come here, who have come here in peace, please leave here in peace. Uh, if, you have any question, if, if you have any questions that you have on anything that you heard here today, ask and a, your questions shall be answered. If I cannot answer your question, we will send your question to 5335 South Greenwood Avenue, Chicago, Illinois and it will go to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and an answer will be forthcoming. After that was over, he said, when you leave here, go in peace. Do not make trouble. Do not attack anyone. But we do not teach you to turn the other cheek. If someone attacks you, fight him in the name of God. Knock him down. And call on God. God will help you. There's, not, there's nothing spooky about this. So that's what our teaching was. Now, when Malcolm goes to... Los Angeles, California, the brothers in number seven want to form a crew to go out and seek vengeance from Donald Weiss. 
because the brother who was killed was not just a brother. He was a secretary of the mosque. He was a Korean veteran. He was a college student, and he was about to become a father. So this was a real, 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 real blow. So this put Malcolm in a very awkward position in that all this time he had been talking about the civil rights movement and the nonviolent movement and we don't turn the other cheeks and the Muslims won't take part in a, this kind of a march, civil rights, this, that, and the other. And now when the crux came, the nation didn't do any different than the, the other people had been doing. And this made Malcolm, whew, it bothered him. It bothered him a whole lot. And I am told, but I'm not, I can't corroborate this, that Mr. Muhammad was told, send him out of, get him out of here. And so he was sent back to the East Coast. But before, now this he told me out of his own mouth. He said, not in 1963, he didn't tell, him, he didn't tell me this until 1964, after he was out of the mosque. He said, uh, he went to Mr. Muhammad. We had a charity slip. I think it had eight lines on it. One was for Savior's Day. One was for the uh, number two poor treasury. One was for administration, et cetera. And he asked Mr. Muhammad if we could put another line on the charity slip so everybody in the nation could make a contribution if it was only, a, if, even if it was only a dollar a week toward the brothers who had been harmed. Uh, and were, ha would have to receive constant medical care. And he said that Mr. Muhammad told him, we didn't hurt those brothers, the devils hurt those brothers, so let the devils take care of them. Of them. And, and that, that caused a wound to fester. Like the poet said, what happens to a dream deferred? To a dream deferred? Does it, does it, Fester like a sore then run? Does it something like a raisin? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Does it fester like a sore then run? Well, that, that bothered Malcolm. And I think that was the beginning of his, uh, that's my opinion I'm giving. I think that was the beginning of the, the separation. Did that answer your question? Let's talk about uh, November 1963. November 1960, yeah. All right, we have the assassination of then President John Kennedy. Yes. And after the assassination, Brother Malcolm is given some explicit instructions yes. from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes. Can you talk about that? Yeah. First, I have to tell you that Mr. Muhammad was supposed to come to New York City to Manhattan Center to speak on December 1st, 1963. Prior to that, he had given instructions to all ministers not to mention John F. Kennedy by name. In October of 1963, Mr. Muhammad had gone to Flint, Michigan to speak at a big uh, affair. And the police in Flint, Michigan wanted to come in to the meeting with their guns. And therefore, I said, no, you can't come in here with guns. And they said, well, we're not giving up our guns. So they relayed this to Mr. Muhammad. Mr. Muhammad said, then we won't have a meeting because we're not going to have a meeting with people come in with guns. So at that time, Mr. Muhammad said, from now on, no more white people will be allowed to come to any of our meetings. That, that you have to know and understand. So when Mr. Muhammad decided not to come to New York December the 1st, he had already notified all ministers that they were not to refer to Mr. The, the dead President Kennedy by name. So Brother Malcolm would, all the times that Brother Malcolm spoke, he spoke extemporaneously. He didn't uh, write out his speech. He spoke. But whenever he was speaking for Mr. Muhammad, he would write whatever he was to say. So he had written his speech, and he wrote his entire speech. He delivered it. And uh, he made no reference to President Kennedy. I, who was a lieutenant, was put in charge of this meeting. When I got to Manhattan Center, there were two whites 
in the place already. So I called Brother Malcolm at home, and I said, look, there are two members of the press here. Should we put them out? And he said, no, no, no. He said, don't let any more in, but don't put them out. That's, that's bad manners. So these two reporters, I think they were from the Times, after Brother Malcolm delivered his lecture, he opened the floor for questions, which was the custom in the nation. And one of the reporters was recognized and asked Malcolm, what do you feel about the assassination of the president? And Malcolm delivered a little lecture, and he said, well, so in my, in my opinion, it was a case of chickens coming home to roost. And he said, I'm a farm boy. So chickens coming home to roost never made me sad. Chickens coming home to roost always made me glad. Well, John Ali reported that to Mr. Muhammad, and that resulted in Brother Malcolm getting put out of the mosque. We had a, Mr. Muhammad said, black people don't build prisons. That's something that's a white man's thing, building, building a prison and locking people in it. He said, what black people do is, if someone is disagreeable with the group, they exile him from the group. They say, okay, you can't, you can't eat here. You can't stay here. And that's what we did in the nation. So anytime somebody broke a law, he was exiled. We had different classes, class C, maybe 90 days, class F, five years. The only way you could get class F was lay down with another man's wife. You lay down with another man's wife, that was five years out the mosque, automatic. Don't come back among us. You couldn't eat in the restaurant. Nobody could stop and talk to you. If you said salam alaikum, person could say, well, alaikum salam, but keep walking. Don't stop. Because if you stopped to talk to someone who was put in exile, you had to do his time too. Like if you were out the mosque for five, for five years, and I said, come on, brother, let's get a milkshake. That milkshake would cost me five years if I was drinking it with you because I got no business. Do you understand that? So uh, that's how it was. Then I, I, I lose my train of thought. That's good. That's good. Okay. okay. That's the, the first segment. So we've gone a little more than 30 minutes, and uh, we're going to pick up our story right here in December 1963. At that point that we ought to stop, and when we come back after this break, stay with us. <laughs> 